Hi, welcome back. This is topic 12 of OCR A-level chemistry, reaction rates. Now we'll start off with GCSE reaction rates. And you know some things which speed up the rate of a reaction from GCSE. And you still need to know those at A-level. They are increasing the temperature, increasing the pressure of a gas, increasing the concentration of a solution, increasing the surface area of a solid, or adding a catalyst. And those things fit into three categories in my head. Temperature, catalysts, and then things which increase the number of particles that there are in a given volume. Increasing the pressure of a gas, increasing the number of particles that are colliding, increasing the concentration of a solution, increasing the number of particles that can collide, and increasing the surface area of a solid also increases the number of particles that can collide. Increasing the temperature speeds up the molecules so that they collide more frequently and also with more energy. And then catalysts, at GCSE, you can say that they give an alternative route for a reaction to happen, thus lowering the activation energy of a reaction. And those are the explanations you give at GCSE for why those factors affect the rate of a reaction. Now that's still true, but we're going to add to that. Now when answering these questions at A-level, this is mostly enough. You also need to talk a lot of the time about successful collisions. So for a reaction to happen, you need to have two particles collide in the correct orientation with the correct amount of energy, so more than the activation energy, or for the bonds to break and for those chemicals to react. So when you have more frequent collisions, then it's more likely that those collisions are going to be successful, so you get more frequent successful collisions. When you increase the energy of a collision, then that's also more likely to be successful. And so what we really care about is the frequency of successful collisions. And a successful collision is one which leads to the reaction taking place, rather than the particles just bouncing off each other. And while I'm on the subject of catalysts, there's two types that you need to know, homogeneous and heterogeneous. Now, homo means same and hetero means different. And a homogeneous catalyst is one which exists in the same phase as those chemicals which it's speeding up the reaction. A heterogeneous catalyst exists in a different phase to the chemicals of the reaction. So, for instance, in the Harbour process, when you're making ammonia, those chemicals are all gases, and the catalyst is iron, which is solid. So that would be a heterogeneous catalyst. Whereas if you're talking about the esterification between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid, the catalyst there is hydroxide ions. And so everything's in the same solution, so they're in the same phase, and that's a homogeneous catalyst. Phase is ever so slightly different to state. You can have two things which are in the same state, so two liquids, but that aren't in the same phase. So for instance, water and oil would separate so they're in two different phases, despite the fact they're in the same state. Next, I think it's useful to actually say what a rate of reaction is, and how do we actually measure what a rate of reaction is. And you measure the rate of a reaction by looking at the change in concentration of the products or the reactants over time. And so when we say that something's got a fast rate of reaction, what we're saying is the concentration of the products is increasing at a high rate, or that the concentration of the reactants is decreasing at a high rate. But most of the time, we don't measure concentration. Most of the time, we measure something else when we're measuring rates. And so it's sometimes useful to talk about the rate of change of volume or the rate of change of mass in a reaction. So everything tends to be defined by concentration per unit time rather than volume or mass per unit time. You can also change from the volume of a gas into the concentration of a reactant changing relatively easily. But for the most part, you'll be given concentration changes so you just use concentration change over time. So let's look at a few graphs. So it's from a graph that you can see rate of reaction and how rate of reaction changes the best. Okay, so here are the two types of graph you tend to get. This one on the left shows the change in concentration of a reactant over time. So you can see the reactant gets used up quickly to begin with, and then more and more slowly as the rate goes down. And this one shows the concentration change of a product. So at the beginning there's none, and then it gets made quickly to begin with, and then it slows down as time goes on. This tends to be the shape of the graph because as you go through a reaction, you use up some of the reactants and their concentration goes down. And as we know, concentration is one of the things which changes the rate of reaction. So if you use up a reactant, its concentration goes down and the rate goes down. You have seen this when you put acid in with magnesium, for instance, the bubbles come quickly to begin with and then the bubbles start to slow as the reaction progresses. It's because the concentration of the acid is decreasing because it's reacting with the magnesium and also the surface area of the magnesium is decreasing as it reacts with the acid. So there's two things which are decreasing, which makes the rate slow down. 
and you can calculate a rate from this graph. And the way you do that is by measuring the gradient of a tangent at any time. So for instance, mostly we want to measure the initial rate, so the rate right at the beginning of the reaction. You do that by drawing a tangent at time equals zero and then calculating its gradient by doing changing y divided by changing x. Okay, so these two lines draw in red, this one and this one both show the same rate. One of them shows the rate of decrease of the reactants, and this one shows the rate of increase of the concentration of the products. So if you extend your tangent all the way to the x-axis, you can read off the time, you can read off the concentration change, and then you just do concentration change divided by time to give you the rate. Same one here, if you take any point upon that red line and do the time and the concentration, you can work out rate in the same way. Now, all rates are positive. All reactions which are going forward have a positive rate of reaction. And so this one, you'll get a negative answer for your gradient. Just make that gradient positive. Also, you'll see that some products are made quicker than other products. Say, for instance, one of the products has a stoichiometric coefficient of 2 and the other one has a stoichiometric coefficient of 1. Then one of them is going to be made twice as fast as the other one because for every reaction it's making twice as many products. And that would give you two different rates if you measured one of them and measured the other one. So the way that you standardise it is you always do it for a stoichiometric coefficient of 1. So how do we actually measure rates? We tend to do it in two ways. The first way is measuring the change in mass as a gas is released. And the second way is by measuring the change in volume of the gas that's released. It seems to be at AS, all the reactions that you'll be dealing with the rate of will be ones which are producing the gas, because those are the easiest ones to measure the rate of. So you could easily get a graph like this with the y-axis as volume of gas produced, so maybe this graph over here, and you can measure the rate in the same way. Now, there's a couple of intricacies that you could talk about, and why not? When you're talking about carbon dioxide being given up, then you can measure the rate at which the gas is produced, which would give you a graph that looks like this, or you could look at the rate at which the mass is lost, which would give you a graph that looks like this. Either way, you can measure the rate of that reaction. It gives you units of centimetres cubed per second or grams per second. Now, it's possible also to change those using the equations for moles that we've talked about already into moles per decimeter cubed per second. But I've never seen those questions come up, so I'm not going to talk about them. But if you're doing a reaction like I talked about earlier, magnesium and hydrochloric acid, the gas being given off is hydrogen. And with hydrogen, you couldn't measure it using the mass being given off because the mass of hydrogen gas is so little there will be almost no mass change from one second to the next. And almost always in schools, the balances are only to two decimal places. And so you need to have quite a large volume of hydrogen gas being given off because it's so low density for any kind of meaningful mass change. So it's much better, because it occupies the same amount of space as carbon dioxide per mole, that you just use a gas volume method rather than a mass loss method. Now we can measure concentration changes without measuring the amount of gas being given off. There are a lot of reactions that don't give off gas, and for all of those there are ways of doing it, they're just not on the specification. So we can use titration methods, or we can use colour change methods and how quickly they change colour. Or you can look at the temperature change, or the change in electrical conductivity. But none of these are on the specification, so we're not going to talk about them in any detail. Now the last thing on the specification is a thing called Boltzmann distribution. So I'll draw a Boltzmann distribution on the board. Okay, so this is the shape of the Boltzmann distribution. What the Boltzmann distribution shows is for a substance, the number of particles in that substance with any given energy. And this shape doesn't change. There's always no particles with no energy. And it increases to a peak number of particles with a certain energy. That energy is like the mode average energy. And then it decreases, but never quite reaches zero. So it's asymptotic to zero. There's always a few particles with a lot of energy in a substance. And as you'd expect, temperature has an effect on this. So the higher the temperature, the more particles you have with a large amount of energy, and the less particles you have with a small amount of energy. So this red line represents a higher temperature than the black line. You can see there's fewer particles with less energy, and more particles with more energy. The whole shape has just basically been spread out and lowered slightly. We can't have more particles at a higher temperature, because we're talking about the same substance. So it doesn't have any more particles. So the area has got to be the same underneath the line. And you see that this peak goes down and to the right. And if you want to draw a lower temperature than the black line, 
then this peak needs to go left and up. So I'll draw a lower temperature as well. So the blue line represents the lowest temperature, black line is the temperature in the middle, and then the red line is the highest temperature. You can see the red line has the most particles with high energy. So if I put on an arbitrary activation energy, the activation energy is important when you're talking about a chemical reaction. So to put it on, only particles higher than the activation energy are going to react. So we need to know how much energy that is. And so this actually explains why higher temperatures increase the rate of a reaction. If you look here at the blue line, only the molecules or particles with more energy than this activation energy are going to react. They're represented by this little blue area. If we increase the temperature to T2, then all these extra particles can also react. So between the blue line and the black line, there's more particles there that can react. There's more particles with sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy at a higher temperature. And those extra particles are the ones coded in black. So now there's the black and the blue ones as particles with enough energy to overcome the activation energy and react. At an even higher temperature, those ones in red, above the black line but below the red line, can also react. And so you can see, as you increase the temperature from blue to black to red, you get more and more particles with sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy and react. So you get more frequent successful collisions. And there's one other thing you can show on a Boltzmann distribution, and that is the reason why a catalyst lowering the activation energy increases the rate of a reaction. So this is the activation energy of an uncatalyzed reaction. If I draw on a separate line to show a catalyzed reaction, that is going to be lower lower energy because it's lower activation energy. So I've just labelled that activation energy with catalyst. And let's talk about the cold reaction. The cold reaction without the catalyst, only these particles could react. If I add a catalyst, it lowers the activation energy, then all of these particles can react. And so you can see now that there's probably twice as many particles that can react. So the rate of the reaction is going to increase. And that's just with a small activation energy decrease. If you decrease it even further, then you're going to get many, many more particles with enough energy to overcome that and react. And so you get a faster rate of reaction. And so sometimes you get questions about why catalysts are used in terms of sustainability. And it's because you can use lower energy. You can use lower temperatures. You can buy less energy from the energy companies, so they have to buy less fossil fuels. And the cost of everything goes down. You get less CO2 emitted. You get less global warming. So catalysts help the sustainability of chemical reactions just basically by lowering that activation energy and decreasing the temperature that you need to do a reaction at to get a reasonable rate of reaction. Because companies care about the rate of a reaction, they're going to sell the products of their reaction. So they want it to go quickly, but they don't want to buy a lot of energy in. And so adding a catalyst is a way of circumventing that. You don't have to buy a load of energy in, you just have to get a catalyst. And that catalyst can be reused because catalysts don't get used up in a reaction. So they're kind of the perfect way of making your chemical reaction more economically viable. Okay, and that's everything from this reaction rates topic. There's more on it in A2 chemistry, but for now, that's everything. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you on the next one. Goodbye.